Okay, now sodium ion reabsorption. So obviously sodium is water soluble and would get pushed out. And of course you have a lot of sodium in your extracellular fluid and um, blood plasma is extracellular fluid. So you're gonna push out quite a bit of sodium and you are going to have two different opportunities to reabsorb it. So sodium reabsorption is mostly active. There's a whole bunch of different active transport mechanisms, but this one, um, remember that we just reabsorbed glucose and of course it was reabsorbing sodium too. And I can use that mechanism to bring sodium back into the bloodstream. And there are other places that I can do that as well. So it's mostly active transport reabsorption and it occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. And then there's a separate step in which it occurs in the distal convoluted tubule. Um, so there's two sodium reabsorption steps. The first one occurs from the proximal convoluted tubule back into the bloodstream. And that is what we call non-regulated reabsorption of sodium. 65% um, of the sodium that you pushed out will get reabsorbed right there at the proximal convoluted tubule back into the paratubular capillaries. This is non-regulated reabsorption. No hormones or anything have any influence on it. So no control over the quantity. It's always push it out and then immediately reabsorb 65% of it. So that's called non-regulated reabsorption. They used to call it obligatory reabsorption until we realized that a lot of students didn't know what the word obligatory means. It means you're obliged to do it, obligatory or non-regulated reabsorption. So push it out and then immediately 65% of it is reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. The second reabsorption step is the one that you have control over, and it's primarily at the distal convoluted tubule, although a little bit also at other places. So let's just see distal convoluted tubule reabsorption of sodium. This is regulated reabsorption, and what regulates it is primarily um, the hormones aldosterone and um, ANP. Okay, so hold on to that idea for just a second. So what we can do is we reabsorb 65% of it, and then um, we look when we get to the distal convoluted tubule at whether we need to reabsorb um, any or all of that 35% of sodium that's still left in the tube. So um, regulated reabsorption, also sometimes called facultative reabsorption. So how do we do this? So the major stimuli that would cause, for instance, you to reabsorb some or all of that 65% is by looking at the blood and looking at the pee and deciding whether you need to reabsorb it. For instance, if in the bloodstream, there is a decrease in either blood pressure or blood flow to the kidney, then you might say, hey, mm, we could probably help with that by reabsorbing some of that 35% of the sodium that's in the tube. That would help with blood pressure and potentially blood flow. Um, and then the other thing that you can look at is the tube, the P. What is in the P? If there is a whole bunch of fluid and solutes in the pee, maybe you re need to reabsorb them. So what will happen is you will assess what is both in the bloodstream and in the pee to figure out whether you need to reabsorb any of that 35%. And the way that you do that is by using the juxtaglomerular apparatus again. And the juxtaglomerular apparatus we looked at before, where the heck are you, juxtaglomerular apparatus? Okay, so the juxtaglomerular apparatus is this time, instead of doing those minor tweaks that it did with just um, myogenic regulation and tubuloglomerular feedback, um, this is going to assess what's going on in the afferent arterial and in the distal convoluted tubule to figure out whether I need to like release aldosterone. So stick with me. We've done this before, but we need to put it in the context of the kidney. So the juxtaglomerular apparatus monitors both blood pressure flow and distal convoluted tubule solute content and the amount in there. And if it detects either of these stimuli, those are oversimplified, there's more ways that you can describe it, but we need to keep it simple for a second. If it detects either of those low stretch here, meaning I don't have enough pressure and therefore not enough flow to cause um, a good filtration, or it detects a high co concentration of sodium in the distal convoluted tubule, what's going to happen is we are going to do this process that you already learned. So let's look at it again. Um, these are extrinsic mechanisms that involve hormones. What is going to happen is if you detect 
a drop in blood pressure or fluid volume, or now you know um, uh, too much sodium in the tube, then the kidney will release renin. Let's go through this again. And renin will convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, okay? Then um, ACE from the lungs will convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And this is what we concentrated on in the last set of notes, how in response to low pressure you will do vasoconstriction for high pressure. But what I want to concentrate on in this set of notes is that angiotensin 2 will cause the release of the hormone aldosterone. And aldosterone will cause um, the distal convoluted tubule to reabsorb some or all of that 35%. So aldosterone increases the regulated reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule. So what will happen is when aldosterone is present, you will reabsorb some or all of the sodium at the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, so the net effect is what you already learned, but now you're learning a little bit of the mechanism. Um, renin, what it does to the kidney is that renin um, will cause increased sodium ion reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule. If possible, water will follow it. I'll talk about water following it in just a minute. And when that occurs, when water follows it, it will increase blood volume and therefore increase blood pressure. So the big picture was basically if you detect low pressure, you can increase the pressure by two different mechanisms. So aldosterone acts on the kidney to stimulate sodium reabsorption and then therefore also water reabsorption if possible. There is something that needs to be there in order for water to follow. Okay, so the opposite is also true. If you detect instead of low pressure there, if you detect high pressure there, hold on. If you detect instead of low pressure at the afferent arterial, you detect high pressure at the afferent arterial and or low osmolarity of the filtrate, low amount of sodium in the filtrate, um, then you'll decrease renin um, secretion, decrease angiotensin to, and therefore decrease aldosterone and increased amount of sodium that actually gets lost, right? So if you detect high pressure, you would not activate any of this. Um, and of course, your reminder is that angiotensin II also raises blood pressure by causing systemic vasoconstriction. Okay, now, um, but I want to remind you that aldosterone does not generally move sodium by itself. It reabsorbs sodium by swapping it for either potassium. So whenever you use aldosterone for sodium reabsorption, it causes potassium secretion, or aldosterone can cause sodium reabsorption and H plus secretion. Therefore, elevated aldosterone um, will result in the increased potassium or H plus loss. Okay, and you learned that way back in the endocrine chapter. So there is one other hormone that can affect what's going on here. So basically, aldosterone will increase sodium reabsorption to the distal convoluted tubule. But is there anything that will actively decrease it? Yeah, there is. It's ANP, that heart, that hormone that comes from the heart. ANP is released in response to prolonged atrial wall stretching. And what it will do is ANP decreases the distal convoluted tubule reabsorption of sodium because prolonged atrial wall stretching could indicate hypertension or high blood pressure. So you don't want to reabsorb that um, sodium. And ANP also inhibits the release of aldosterone. Okay, so it decreases um, DCT reabsorption of sodium, which will of course decrease your blood pressure. It will inhibit the release of aldosterone, which will not increase your blood pressure, but then it does one other thing. So these are both related to reabsorption, but ANP also, stick with me, um, causes dilation of the afferent arteriole, which will increase filtration which will increase water and sodium loss and therefore decrease blood pressure. So these two are related to reabsorption, but this one is related to filtration and it does all of these things. So the net effect is that when you release A and P, it decreases your blood volume and therefore decreases your blood pressure. Okay, so I'm gonna just tack these two on the end and then uh, I'll do water reabsorption in the next video. So.
that's sodium reabsorption. Just to recap, sodium reabsorption happens twice. The first time is non-regulated at the proximal convoluted tubule. 65% can't do a damn thing about it. The second time you do it is at the distal convoluted tubule. And the distal convoluted tubule is controlled primarily by aldosterone, which increases reabsorption at the DCT, and ANP, which decreases reabsorption at the DCT, and a couple of other things. Okay, so let's talk about a few other things that we are going to reabsorb. Potassium reabsorption. Potassium reabsorption is not super well understood. We're pretty sure that it's an active process um, but they're putting unknown mechanism in your textbook. But 90% of the potassium that got pushed out is reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule. You always lose 10% of it, always. So the potassium that you eat, you're always going to lose some of it. There is no way to regulate reabsorption of the rest of the potassium. But remember that you can lose more than 10% if aldosterone is present because aldosterone will cause potassium secretion. Okay, so generally speaking, you are gonna lose some potassium. So if you look at potassium here, usually you reabsorb in total after the amount that you reabsorb plus the amount that you potentially, potentially secrete. Usually you only get to keep about 86% of your potassium, which ends up mattering because A, there's less potassium in their diet than our diet than sodium, and B, we're always gonna lose some of it. So Potassium ends up being um, an ion whose composition and concentration in the bloodstream you need to pay attention to. Okay, um, last thing before we get to water is what about the negative ions? So we talked about sodium and we talked about potassium. What about your negative ions like chloride and bicarbonate? Those are really important to reabsorb, but we don't usually have to worry about them very much because we um, try so hard to reabsorb all of those positive ions that we end up creating an electrical gradient so that the negative ions want to follow them. And all they need is a channel to find, find a channel to go through and they will follow the electrical gradient that was created by the active reabsorption of all of those positive ions. Okay, in the next video, we're gonna talk about water reabsorption, which is a three-step process.